Hi, everybody. Good afternoon. My name is Tisha Benton, and I am the Vice Chancellor for Communications here at the University of Tennessee, Knoxville. Um, thank you for being here today. I know everyone has a number of questions, so we want to go ahead and get started. The first thing I want to do is emphasize that we have no cases um, of coronavirus, also known as COVID-19, on our campus at this time. Um, and we are in regular communications with the Knox County Health Department and understand that so far in Knox County, um, as of this afternoon, there are no cases in Knox County as well. Um, so, but we do want to kind of let you know how we've been planning. There, the leadership team has been um, involved in operational decisions and contingency planning since the end of January. And as this situation has evolved, so has our planning response to it. And so for the last couple of weeks, we've had the Emergency Operations Center for the University um, mobilized and a group of leadership from the university involved in making policy decisions. Um, just a few minutes ago, Chancellor Plowman had um, a message that came out updating a, mes a message from last week um, to campus, letting everyone know that effective immediately, in addition to the international travel um, suspension that we put in place last week, we now also have a domestic travel suspension um, for non-essential UT-related travel. Um, we are also working with faculty and graduate teaching assistants to um, prepare in the event that we need to move classes online. So that preparation is happening and uh, we have ramped up cleaning across campus and we will also use spring break next week as an opportunity to even further um, ramp up those cleaning efforts. And so this is really an opportunity to ask university administrators questions regarding um, our preparedness and our planning. Um, and so I want to introduce who we have with us today, Chris Semino, Senior Vice Chancellor for Finance and Administration, Frank Cuevas, um, Interim Vice Chancellor for the Division of Student Life, uh, David Manderscheid, Provost and Senior Vice Chancellor, and Dr. Spencer Gregg, um, Head of our Student Health Center, and also the Incident Commander in the Emergency Operations Center for this particular um, issue. So I'm going to step away and uh, let you all ask questions of this team, and we'll go from there. Thank you. We followed um, CDC guidelines on bringing those students back. In particular, the students from Italy uh, were uh, told to self-isolate as required by CDC guidelines. Uh, as far as we know, that's been total compliance. Some of them have gone home to do that. Uh, but we have been following CDC guidelines in that respect. Right, right. They are in self-isolation, and none of them have tested positive. None of them have shown symptoms at this point. At this time, we have no plans to cancel any campus events. Uh, it is something we're looking at in terms of the numbers uh, of events that we have coming up in the next 30 to 60 days, and we'll continue to monitor that as we go forward. What's the um, current contingency plan if a confirmed case of coronavirus were to be on campus or in the Knoxville region? Yeah, we talked about that today, and we're still looking to find out and, and look for, for what that trigger point would be, whether it's in the region or Knox County, and what would that mean for the point at which we take a, uh, all our courses online. So we still don't have a decision on that. But I, just to hasten to add, we're meeting almost on a daily basis, you know, to be apprised of these situations and getting constant information from the Knox County Public Health Department. So 
What we have, we'll be putting out information today to students uh, and to staff to encourage them to be safe, obviously, during their time on spring break. Uh, we, in that um, message that we'll be putting out, it communicates ways that they can do that. It will advise them to kind of give really good consideration about what their travel plans are. Uh, this would not be a good time to be traveling to a CDC uh, level three alert country like China or Iran. Uh, Italy or South Korea um, and there could be other countries that get added to that list. The issues that could come up there would be that students may get there in those countries and have difficulty getting back to the United States. They might would have to have a isolation or quarantine once they've arrived back so that could prevent them from getting back to campus when they had initially planned. Um, and even here within the United States there's areas that are being more adversely affected by the uh, COVID-19 and so just being um, aware of what local health officials in those areas are recommending um, is important to know too because whatever those local health officials tell you to do from the standpoint of self-isolation you're required to do that and so it would be important to make sure that you know where your travel plans are going and what the recommendations are uh, both entering and exiting that area. We do not, and that's, that's true across the board for physicians' offices. Uh, the only place that uh, COVID testing is available now are through particular labs uh, where the CDC has released those, uh, the lab kits for. Uh, there are, uh, were a limited number of those. They're beginning to increase in number now. Uh, any testing that is performed on a, a patient uh, has to meet, that patient has to meet certain criteria. Do they have a, an appropriate travel history that suggests that they could be at risk for COVID? So certainly coming from a place like South Korea, Italy, um, uh, Iran or, Ch or China would be of concern. And then in addition to that, do they have symptoms? So if you find a patient that fits both those criteria, they're symptomatic that, and that's symptoms suggestive of COVID, fever, cough, shortness of breath, uh, and they have an appropriate travel history, then you would want to um, see about having the test performed. That's not up to the individual uh, physician or provider to make that decision. That's only made in consultation with the local health department authorities. And so once uh, the, like here at UT, we would get in touch with the Knox County Health Department and we would discuss it with them. If, it, if they felt like testing was warranted, then we would go ahead and collect those samples, get those sent to the state lab, uh, which, uh, typically is around 24 to 48 hours on a turnaround time for the results and then we would be able to know what what they is at this point we've not had to do that uh, we've gave given a couple of phone calls uh, to the health department but just kind of um, more on a just making sure I didn't need to worry about this and them supporting that oh yes that's not something that we would be concerned about at this point Uh, sport, sporting events in terms of, and that, that domestic travel is out of state, so it's only out of state travel, um, and it would be non-team, uh, tr uh, team travel would be okay. It, it's the non-team travel that would be suspended in terms of athletics. And then it's all other faculty and staff travel that may be in the works for conferences and other trips across the U.S. I would add there that many of these conferences that for example, I was scheduled to go to a conference in San Diego on Friday and it was canceled. So many of these events are already being canceled. Uh, we had many viewers ask us about this. Um, so I'm going to ask you, um, in regards to students who may be from countries who um, have been quarantined or have a high level of cases, um, has the university had any instances of maybe discrimination or people feeling uncomfy on campus because maybe they come from one of those countries? With respect to that, we have not had reported incidences of that uh, situations. We are, our Dean of Students Office is providing support to all students if they have concerns. And we would, if those were to arise, we would follow normal protocols to follow up and, and make sure that those students who are experiencing any um, adverse react, uh, response would be the appropriate support.
Absolutely. So we have over 280 buildings on campus and 15 million square feet. Uh, we have a thorough cleaning process already in place, but in the last few weeks we have actually stepped that up with additional cleaning. Uh, what that looks like is going through buildings after hours um, in order to do additional cleaning around handles and doorknobs and, and classroom seating and surface areas. Um, we continue to do that uh, through spring break and in addition, in spring break, we will just be able to get into even more of the classrooms, more of the offices, and, and carry out that cleaning uh, even further. We have actually implemented additional cleaning uh, routines daily uh, in all the residence halls, and particularly in the high traffic areas, we know that we're going to have more students uh, trafficking through. So that has ramped up. And similar to what's happening across campus next week, our staff will be going through and doing some very deep cleaning in all those areas. If I could add something to uh, The Center for Disease Control has issued guidance on their recommendations for cleaning at, at where we're at at this point uh, with the outbreak, but how to step those procedures up and what more needs to be done uh, if you were to actually have a, a patient or a student that's under investigation or has actually been diagnosed with COVID-19. So if we actually had a student here that was under investigation for COVID or had been diagnosed with it, then there would be additional cleaning measures that are recommended by the CDC that we would adhere to for that. Right. And we, this is, you know, we have to evaluate it at any given time. We don't feel that that's necessary at this point because there have been no confirmed campus cases. But if you look at other schools like Vanderbilt, for example, when there was a confirmed case involving one of their students who came back from Italy, that's when they chose to move online. Yeah, we haven't decided what those triggers would be at this point because it is evolving, but that would be example, one example of something we might look at. Yeah, thank you. Absolutely. For example, the SEC provost, we have a very active listserv. So we, when uh, last week when we were talking about a travel ban on international travel, that was discussed. What are you doing? Similarly, I'm sure that uh, when they see that we've banned uh, domestic travel, except in, within the state of Tennessee, that will be, yeah, which I've, I'm going to share now that it's public, um, they'll be asking questions about that also. So, yes, we're looking at what other institutions in the SEC are doing, what other institutions nationally are doing, and then also what other, uh, what other institutions in the state of Tennessee is doing. We're in con the chancellor's in contact with the TEAC, uh, Tennessee Higher Education Committee uh, Council, and, and Mike Krause. So, yes, we are looking at what other universities are doing. We're not, we don't want to reinvent the wheel here, so we want to do best practices. Thank you. Right. Those, those students are now, uh, and maybe others can comment on this too, there were 12 students that came to Japan that came under guidance that uh, it was safe to, for them to come to the United States, but then right after they arrived here, those 12 students, uh, the CDC changed the guidance and said they should not uh, congregate. They, sh they didn't go so far as to say self-isolate. But we made the decision that we needed to uh, isolate them from other student populations, so we did so. None of the students has shown any signs of the virus uh, where uh, they will, um, their self-isolation ends the 17th, if I recall correctly, of March. So they're about a week into that.
that's something that we would continue to work through. As, as we said, this is an evolving uh, situation. So one of the th issues that we're talking through is what, what would that look like for our students? Obviously, we would want to limit, uh, limit the interaction. So having that many students in a residential environment uh, would be counter to what we're trying to do. So we would be working through those. Uh, we have, uh, we are, are currently continuing campus tours, but we are asking for lists of students who are coming to campus and seeing if there's any concerns on our part. But we're planning to continue campus tours to um, at this point. Yeah, but that could be that could change. Things could be reevaluated. What we've, uh, what we will adhere to are the CDC's guidelines on those individuals that are returning. So presently, the the guidelines are that if you uh, have been around a person that has been diagnosed with a COVID infection, uh, if you're coming from a level three alert country, uh, then those are individuals that should be isolated from other people until that 14-day period is over with, and they've. Uh, they clearly have not exhibited any signs or symptoms. If they get sick during that time period, then it would potentially be even a longer period of time that they have to stay isolated. Um, in addition, because of the difficulty with truly isolating a patient on a college campus, um, we've also taken the step of advising that if there's a level two country that's involved, which doesn't require isolation from the CDC, but just does require requests, limited contact. So. We've requested that if you're coming from a level two country that you um, adhere to those recommendations and for each of those uh, categories, if you've been around someone that's been diagnosed with COVID, if you're coming from a level three country or if you're coming from a level two country, then we're requesting that you not return to campus until that 14 day period has elapsed and you've been free of symptoms during that entire time. Uh, well, we we have not uh, to this point uh, made a request for that. Uh, we have we are aware of those that uh, would have been going on university-related travel, and of course have, have requested those to come back. That would be a purely voluntary um, thing for students to do, and so uh, they're certainly not under any obligation to make us aware of that. Uh, but what we would just advise them is that. If they're going, uh, when they return to the United States, they're going to be given directives through the Center for Disease Control about self-isolation, and our anticipation is that they will adhere to those. Uh, I would also mention that uh, the um, uh, local health authorities have broad authority in regard to enforcing those isolation periods, uh, so it's not anything that I would uh, feel comfortable uh, attempting to circumvent. Well, it's most certainly we have seen that petition and we have seen that concern on students' part. And we did take that into account in, in making our decisions. Uh, but at this point, there have been no cases on campus and there's been, you know, no, nobody that's even been tested at this point. So that we felt we should be prepared and we understand the students' concerns most vividly, but it wasn't necessary at this point.
to note um, again that this is a constantly evolving situation, and so right. a decision today might not be a decision tomorrow. And um, I think that's an important thing that this group and others um, and the senior leadership team and the Emergency Operations Center are constantly reviewing new information and decisions are changing as that happens. Um, and, and that is the nature of, I think, this kind of situation. And so we recognize the, um, the evolving nature of, of this and are committed to continually reassessing things. So again, a decision today doesn't mean it's a decision tomorrow. And that's one of the reasons that when you, it, if you've seen um, the chancellor's email and um, an email from the provost will be going to faculty and Dr. Gregg to students that it talks about you know, you go leave for spring break, take your things with you so that you are prepared to be able to be on class online should the decision change and that becomes necessary, um, you know, using spring break for faculty to be able to prepare to go on to an online environment should that become necessary. So again, um, nothing is off the table, but we also want to make, we want to make sure that we are absolutely pre prepared but we are not panicked in that. And so that is the, that is um, how we are trying to navigate these decisions on a daily basis. If I may give an example of that, um, with Italy, uh, we were prepared. When Italy went to level three, we were in contact with those students almost immediately. It went to level three of approximately five o'clock on a Friday afternoon, 11 p.m. in Italy. We were emailing those students. We were calling them the next morning and getting them out uh, as soon as possible. So that was a clear, we were prepared to make those decisions, but we didn't feel it was necessary at that point. But then when it became necessary, we acted very quickly and decisively. I think the other thing is that we're encouraging our students to have conversations with their families. Uh, as, as things are evolving and changing, we want not only for the students to notify their families where they're going, where they're traveling, but also what would the plan look like and if they're either about returning to campus or if they're feeling, uh, have symptoms, what they should do to be able to make sure they can self-isolate and seek the assistance they need.